All right, y'all. Now that the glitch is under control, can y'all see the uh, slides? Yeah. Cool. All right. So this is where we left off. Um, what did you all think about the, did we show the second ad? Yes. What did you think about the second ad? Not the ad, yeah, the Sean Hannity video. It's the, it's the thing, uh, Demented Joe. That's what, they, that's what they like to say. I mean, based on that video though, Uncle Joe does seem to be suffering from a little bit of senility. Just a wee bit. He was like, you know, if you find the cure, it's gonna get even worse. And it's like, all right. I know what you meant, Uncle Joe, but wow. Yeah, I think he had like good intentions, like when Joe was talking, I think he had good intentions, but I just think he got like mixed up in his words to them and so like people took advantage of that. And you know, and it happens to the best of us, but part of me wonders, do you think there's a way that uh, Uncle Joe could uh, combat this? How he could overcome this or prevent these gaffes from happening again? Maybe like practicing his speeches. So we have okay. one. We have one for practicing his speeches. Perhaps don't do live streams. The debates are going to be interesting. Whenever the debates will happen. Whenever those happen. <laughs> we, I guess speak it into existence, I guess. But yeah, like, I think after The View, actually no, he should have never, The View should have been a recorded segment. Like doing it live, because of course, you know, I don't think The View is even done live, I think. I know the real and like other like the daytime talk shows aren't live. They're like maybe 10 or 15 minutes in advance. So yeah, I feel like it could have been taped. But yeah, I would no longer do live segments. Even if it is my wife or one of my grandchildren editing the videos afterwards, like make sure that they do a top notch job or as top notch as possible. Yeah, like at this point now, Donald Trump is making fun of Nancy Pelosi. So like I thought that, so originally I thought from the uh, Nancy Antoinette video that Donald Trump was poking fun at the fact that she had $24,000 worth of groceries in her freezer. But no, apparently that refrigerator freezer combo cost $24,000. And I was just like, where do you get an expensive uh, appliance like that? Like if you ever get a chance to like watch it on your own, uh, there's a scene where like she opens the freezer and there's nothing but Jenny's ice cream in there. And I was like, that could make it $24,000. Each pint is like 10 bucks. That's a lot. It's an arm and a leg. So. They're, so they're so hypocritical though. Because the Republican senators make millions of dollars every year. Millions of dollars every year. And they, they're so, they're, it's hypocritical. I mean, but you, but you have to remember, you know, Pelosi and, and Schumer. It's a, it's a, yeah. Pelosi and Schumer, you know, they they were uh, originally against the uh, coronavirus stimulus. You know, they wanted to make yeah. sure that their their interests were covered, and then of course, you know, that was painted in a negative light. They were holding us up from our checks. Well, in particular, my check. <laughs> I bought a. That no, wasn't enough. It ran out of money. Surely didn't. Like, they, they just had to redo it. But it's okay. I was able to get a uh, a gaming quality monitor from my office. Not that I play computer games, but I now have the proper monitor from which to teach instead of like teaching from two different laptops. Now I teach from two different laptops and a monitor. Moving up in the world. But yeah, I'm trying to see was there. What do you think of the Trump press conference yesterday? <sighs> where he said to drink cleaning, inject cleaning products. Radiate yourself with UV light. I, I, I don't know. What would what, what, I don't. I, at this point, it, they're just gaffes among gaffes. Among gaffes. What did Dr. Fauci say? <laughs> I, I'm pretty sure. He's, no he's no longer at the briefings. That's interesting. 
He doesn't want to be. He says the two-hour briefings every day are way too draining for him. But he's like the voice of reason, though. There is no reason in that White House. There's reason. We can rely on the general surgeon. That's what we can do. Rely on him, and he will lead us to the promised land. He's not that great either. I said he will lead us to the promised land. <laughs> we all can't have what we want. Now this is his chance to shine. It's going to get better. You know, Georgia's opened up today. They're talking about Ohio may open up by the first. Georgia, Georgia opening is the dumbest decision that governor could have made. So we're going to talk trash about my home state? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> There's still increasing cases. I've already Trump even said it was a bad idea. I've told my uh, my brother, my sister, and my grandmother they should stay in the house through Mother's Day. Like I don't care like what is going on out there. You need to let everybody else catch it. You stay in the house. Wait and see what happens. I mean, but you know, everybody's gonna watch Georgia and then Texas, and then if not that many people die, then the rest of the nation will open up. It's a win-win for I trust us all. The wine. I trust Mike DeWine. You trust Mike DeWine? All right. Oh, for sure. With this, with this case, not as politics, but with this, with this, with his, with his way to lead to the virus, he's been one of the best. Okay. All right. Well, let's get back Disagree? in. Disagree. I still feel, uh, I feel a little salty about the way he handled the primary. So, like, he still has his own uh, political motives. But you know, but he's but he's it but you know he's be. not Georgia. He's not Georgia. He's not Wisconsin. You know, and and it appears he's doing a little bit better than the Michigan governor. Governor, but it's just never a good look to just have people protesting. Well, it's they're always gonna protest. Are they there's really? Protests in all 50, there's protests in all fifty states. Open it up. It's ridiculous. They're they're flying. Conf it's a it's a Trump rally. They're flying Confederate flags, MAGA flags, and there's only like a hundred people there. Well, there's you know, photos. I can I had their photos. I mean, I showed, I, I, sh I showed clips. Uh, I sh yeah, I've, I've shown clips. I've seen. You see this photo? Yeah, and the ladies, yeah, the ladies like land in the free, and there's like a, a scrub dude, the scrub dude, a nurse, the scrub dude. Yes, a nurse, a medical official. A medical professional, excuse me. The scrub dude, scrub dude. Yeah. I mean, well, you know. Whoever took that picture, they should like win an award. Or if they're like a college student, you can like show that in an art gallery and win prizes. Who is a journalist? Well, maybe that will parlay into a uh, worthwhile article. They can win a Peabody. I knew a little bit. A little bit. Okay, so let us finish all of this stuff. Monday's the, thing, what is the midterm? The final oh, exam. The final. Okay, so the final exam. So our last day of class is Monday. Uh, I was thinking about letting it go live on Thursday and making it be due on Sunday or Monday. Uh, when you start it up, it won't take you that long to ta uh, take it. Uh, give you a 12 hour window. So between Thursday and Sunday to take it. I have to actually upload it this weekend. And it's, and it's, and it's online? Co yeah, you just, kind of yeah, just go into Blackboard and knock it out. All multiple choice? Yep. Alright. And it's the quiz questions? Yep. With some uh, riddles in there, built in there for extra credit. So like, what's uh, black when clean, white when dirty? those kinds of riddles it's gonna be like harder to like figure that out now that we're not at school anymore the answer is a chalkboard see nobody likes see nobody likes the riddles but see the cool part is you're at home and you have the internet so in theory you could find the answer but I will say that is low-key cheating so govern yourselves accordingly if you don't know the answer you don't know the answer to the riddle but it's not that big of a deal so, 
there's that. Uh, Monday will be dedicated to, I can also do a review on Wednesday if you all want or have questions on Wednesday to do a review prior to the uh, final exam. Y'all just let me know. Cool? Will you have our final grades posted in Blackboard at the completion of the final or will we have to wait for the transcripts to come out? Uh, given that it de yeah, so it depends on how quickly you turn in your final exam. Because, you know, once you click enter, it'll be automatically graded. And so after that, yeah, you can see your final grade. Your, and of course, depending upon performance, it'll be your raw grade. And then I think I said for those who participated, it's like a two uh, Those who participated in mock conventions, like two points towards your final oh, grade. Is there any different weight in the uh, grades? What do you mean? Like, are they weighted differently? Uh, the assignments. I don't know if it's just this is just the raw total. I uh, think it's just the raw total. Yeah, it's just the raw total. So all together, the reading assignments should be about 25% of the grade. I'm looking for a... Uh, one of the many syllabi that are now just like ugh, everywhere. Maybe I should have pulled it up on my phone. Are you it? Okay. Thank God. Oh no. Uh, da, 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 da. It is worth something. It's two thirty six. Uh, it's worth the final. Yeah, the midterm and final are each worth twenty five percent. The Reading quizzes were worth 20%. And so since that stopped right when coronavirus, uh, what's it called it? It's whatever your average was at that time. And I'll and still- what about attendance? Uh, don't worry about attendance. Like every, everybody's, every, every, everybody's gonna get a 100. Okay. Like I stopped taking attendance, I think before the midterm happened. And I think I left like the attendance sheet at school. So like I can't even <laughs> check. So no worries on that. Literally the only thing that's left to determine your final grade is the exam. And for uh, Ellie and the other Ellie, their presentation. Any other questions? Please, thank you. No problem. Any other questions? Nope, all right, well, let's get into it. So we left off on economic policy. I'll probably have to do another recording after class, but that's fine uh, to make sure that we're perfectly prepared for Monday. Uh, but market failures as well as collective responses. So what is a market failure? All a market failure is is just the instance when the market fails to produce an efficient outcome. So some examples of problems include incomplete information, uh, also bubbles. Bubbles are just speculative buying that drives up the price of major commodities, in particular real estate, to levels far beyond their intrinsic value. So let's see, examples of other bubbles besides real estate. Uh, the academic bubble is currently, actually it's been bursting for the last five or six years. And it's really devastating, like the liberal arts bubble has popped right now when we're trying to see exactly, you know, how many fatalities are happening. Our school may or may not be caught up in that, but that's a conversation for a different day. Uh, there is also like the, house, uh, the uh, housing bubbles in Chicago and especially in San Francisco. Uh, I think there is one going on currently in Austin, Texas in terms of like driving up the price of housing in particular to levels far beyond their intrinsic value. I'm thinking about back in San Francisco where there was like a place, it was like 300 square feet and they were looking at somewhere between two, it's not not two, it was somewhere between three and four thousand dollars a month. And that's a shoebox. And that's outrageous for a shoebox. 
But ultimately, we want the government to uh, deal with these problems, the problems of incomplete information as well as bubbles. And we want them to do that with carrots and sticks. So what do you mean by carrots and sticks? Well, you know, carrots like a horse. You give a, give a carrot to a horse, the horse is happy, they'll work for the carrot. And then when they're defiant, you beat them with the stick. Dr. Mack does not uh, encourage animal abuse. It's just, you know, a really poorly thought out example that worked. But no, Dr. Mack does not encourage animal abuse. So what are the primary goals of economic policy? Well, primarily it's just to uh, promote stable markets as well as promote economic prosperity. So what do we mean by promoting stable markets? Well, law and order, you provide law and order, you ensure that there is fair and ec not equitable, but fair and access to competition. And then you provide a consistent regulatory structure. Uh, by promoting economic prosperity, you do that by promoting economic growth. Uh, you monitor income as well as employment rates. And then you try to keep inflation as low as possible. So how does this work? One of the tools is through monetary policy. All monetary policy is just money, money policy. It's just an effort to regulate the economy through the manipulation of supply of money and credit. Uh, the biggest uh, organization that does all of this, that's the Federal Reserve System. They facilitate changes, exchanges of cash, checks, and credit. Uh, they regulate member banks. Uh, and ultimately, they use monetary policy to fight inflation as well as deflation. And so low interest rates in particular makes it cheaper to borrow money and thus inject capital into all the money markets. Uh, higher interest rates have the opposite effect. Uh, back during the housing, uh, when the housing bubble crushed in the OOs, critics of the Federal Reserve Board pointed to the fact that the interest rates were kept at historic lows, helping to inflate the real estate bubble. So like I remember there were jokes about uh, people that made like $60,000 a year qualifying for mortgages of upwards of a million dollars. Like there was absolutely no reason and it was just really asinine that a person that made only sixty thousand dollars a year qualified for a mortgage for over a million dollars that you know that was not in their purchasing power have you seen the big short i have heard that like, you're now you're like the third student to ask me <laughs> and now this that answer is still no you know you got them it's a great movie there's so much time now plenty of time to watch it <laughs> but like I had just discovered all these new animes and you know Netflix is releasing stuff like and I still have video games I have to beat but I know you're the third student that's always asked every time I show the slides so it's like Dr. Max show it, fine fine I'll watch have it have you seen Tiger King? <sighs> I know about the memes I don't like watching things once they become popular I'm contrarian in that nature like if everyone's talking about it I don't want to see it but I hear it's mad problematic. It's crazy. The only reason the only reason why it did so well is because of the quarantine. It was a recipe in good timing. Well, I mean it's terrible. It's crazy. It's absolutely insane. Well, cuz what it's a guy who's gay who who has tigers and a like gay pol a gay polygamist who has who has tigers and then there's a never-ending fight uh, with Peta and Another lady down in Florida who, who may have used the tigers to kill so her ex husband. Yeah, a so and so tiger sanctuary and probably killed her ex husband. With the tigers. Fascinating. See, like, and watch that over all my random anime and stuff or play video games? Eh, eh, eh. High quality content. We'll see. Anyways, back to talking about the Federal Reserve. So how the Federal Reserve works is that there are seven members and each member has a 14 year term. And then the president appoints the chair from among those seven members. I'm trying to, yeah, and the chair runs, not runs, uh, it serves a four year term. I'm trying to remember who's chair of the Federal Reserve now. There was at one point in time talks about appointing uh, Herman Cain to be the uh, at, uh, appointing Herman Cain to the uh, Federal Reserve Board, and then of course that kind of fell apart once people uh, not people the media reminded the world about how sketch 
uh, Herman Cain was as a political figure, not as a businessman, but as a political figure. Uh, there is, if you are curious, if you go to uh, YouTube, you can type in The Daily Show and Herman Cain. And he ran, Trevor Noah ran like for three weeks straight, like these little clips about why Herman Cain is just an awful choice. They're hilarious. But anyways, the Federal Reserve, they set the discount rate. They also uh, determine the uh, reserve requirement. That's just the amount of cash that banks must hold. Uh, so basically, if you're thinking about robbing a bank, and you should not rob a bank, what you're trying to get ultimately is a piece of that reserve that the uh, reserve board says each bank must hold. Uh, they also oversee open market operations, in particular buying and selling of government securities, and it also uh, sets the federal funds rate. The Federal Reserve System yeah, the Federal Reserve Board uh, makes sure that the economy keeps going, at least the monetary aspects of it. So what about fiscal policy? All fiscal policy is, is like, yeah, that's different from monetary policy. Fiscal policy regulates the economy through taxing and spending powers. Uh, so taxation, what I'm talking about, income tax, corporate tax, social security tax, tariffs, excise tax, just tax on tax on tax, all the things that are taken out at the beginning of your paycheck and leaves you with what a lot less than what you thought you were gonna have in the first place. Uh, so there are two types of taxes. There's progressive taxes and regressive taxes. Progressive taxes uh, hits the upper income brackets more heavily, so the more money you make, the more you pay in taxes. Meanwhile, regressive hits the lower income tax brackets more heavily, so the more money you make, the less you pay in taxes. So once again, progressive, the more money you make, the more you pay in taxes. Regressive, the more money you make, the less you, play, you, the less you pay in taxes. And so uh, one of the most controversial figures, not figures, issues in American politics is all about taxation, in particular uh, progress, progressive taxation. Uh, the Democratic Party has long argued that higher taxes on the wealthy benefit the economy and society by producing revenue that can be reinvested in infrastructure, in social programs, and so much more, while also freeing up more capital for the middle classes and lower classes uh, to start small businesses and uh, improve the economy through consumer spending. Uh, as recently as the 80s, the tax bracket on the top 2% of Americans was 70%. But, we're, but where is that money, though? Anyways, uh, Republicans, on the other hand, argue that lower taxes on the wealthy produce economic growth by providing entrepreneurial Americans with enough capital to reinvest in the economy. And in doing so, you create more jobs. And so this theory is known as trickle-down eco uh, trickle economics, AKA Reaganomics, and this theory has been a guiding principle for every Republican administration since one Ronald Reagan and his Reaganomics. So what about all of these institutions and policies? So the president and Congress have created institutions designed to the designed to fulfill their own res uh, budgetary responsibilities as well as assert control. And so with that, there are two types of spending. There's mandatory spending as well as discretionary spending. Mandatory spending, these are just budget items that cannot be controlled through the regular budget process. So these are things that are non-negotiable. They appear on every single budget. Discretionary spending, on the other hand, that's just spending on programs that can be controlled, can be debated through the regular budget process. So those are, so uh, mandatory spending, that is, med okay, so Medicare, Social Security, those are like the primary to uh, mandatory spending. Uh, how much federal funding goes for TANF, how much money goes towards, let's say, education, Department of Education, uh, the amount of money sent to the Department of Defense, Homeland Security, all of those, those can actually be controlled through the budget process. So what about antitrust policy? So all antitrust policy is is just the regulation of businesses that establish monopolies. Uh, so previous antitrust legislation had to ultimately overcome the collective principle. So between 1887 and 1914, you have the ICC, the FTC, the Clayton Act, 
Uh, you have the National Labor Review Board and the New Deal in the 30s. And then you have the EPA, OSHA, and all those others in the 70s. It's all about trying to prevent large controls of large sections of business and in, in particular the economy from becoming a thing. Like, but there has been discussions and we talked about it, students talked about it last spring about whether or not the current round, the current sets of antitrust policy are strong enough to deal with what we see uh, Amazon doing, what we see, well not as much as what we see Facebook doing, but what's Google doing, like slowly and surely purchasing things. Like what does that mean for the consumer? That slowly and surely it's only going to be about four or five companies that control everything. I don't know. And I think that actually may be a question to ask, not Nestor, but somebody in the econ department. And then of course, deregulation just refers to reducing or eliminating regulatory restraints. So removing all of the guidelines and rules and regulations that organizations like the EPA, the uh, Review Board, OSHA, etc. Yeah, the, FT the FCC, maybe the FTC too. All of these government entities, all of those bureaucratic offices created by the executive, uh, the executive branch, reducing their power. So that is the end of economic policy. Let's get into the second one. Social policy. So what the heck is social policy? All social policy is, is just programs that promote a range of public goals. Primarily looking at uh, ameliorating ra uh, race, risk and insecurity, uh, promoting equality of opportunity, which is different from equity of opportunity. Equality of opportunity is just a shared ideal that everybody should have freedom to use whatever talents and wealth at their disposal to reach their full potential. And as well as alleviate poverty. And so these three, these three goals in particular are controversial. Uh, in terms of national social policy, uh, we can uh, divide all of this into two time eras, uh, before the New Deal and after the New Deal. Uh, before the New Deal, so before the 30s, uh, federal government's role in alleviating policy, not policy, poverty was very minimal. Uh, the vast majority of poor programs were either state or local, or they were ran by private charities, so private churches, private organizations. Uh, the primary impact of the Great Depression, of course, that changed the game for everyone. Uh, the primary uh, impact of the Depression was to federalize the issues of poverty. Uh, as a result, the construction of the welfare state between 1935 and 1965 continues to be a highly contested uh, aspect of American politics. So why does this matter? So the severity of the Great Depression is really hard for people. Like I, I have been learning about the Great Depression since I was in middle school. And it's like, all right, we've heard time and time again, there's like a picture, uh, there was a picture in one of my history books where it was like this white lady sitting on her porch and she had like six kids around and they all, like, it was like right after a dust bowl. But that's like the picture that they use in my Georgia uh, history books to describe the Great Depression. It was just, yes, it was a struggle for everybody. Uh, but the way that it's at, like what was really going on, uh, the collapsed financial industry, it was really bad. So there was no money. Uh, unemployment was as high as 50% in some major cities. There were record numbers of property foreclosures. It was just a lot going on. Uh, the severity of the Great Depression allowed uh, the Democratic Party with FDR to argue for a new social contract between Americans and the national government. So, you know, a chicken in every pot. And so, I've, I've been saying that for like so long and I can never remember the other part of that. Maybe, just maybe, I may put that as an extra credit question to figure out what did FDR promise in his fireside chats so that Dr. Matt can just say the quote properly. Anyways. And so as a result, one of the biggest aspects of social policy is to talk about or at least try to address or not address, address these issues through redistributive uh, policies. So either shifting wealth from one group to another or yeah. And so as a result of this, some people 
argue that shifting wealth from one group to another is class warfare and that the only way that redistributive policies actually pick up any steam and are actually implemented, it requires both presidential leadership and mass popular support. So one of the biggest reasons, could we consider the coronavirus checks to be redistributive policies? I would say no, because eventually the public is going to have to pay that money back. Uh, redistributive policies take from one group and give it to the other. Uh, one of the biggest examples of redistributive uh, programs, redistributive policies is actually uh, social security because uh, you take from the young and give to the old. Now, of course, it's not that simple because ideally when you're old, you're just taking out what you put in there when you were young, but on its face, you take from the young to take care of the old. So, yeah, that's what I, yeah, that's what these slides say here. Yeah, Social Security, it's a contribute it's a contributory welfare program in which working Americans must place a percentage of their wages into it and then they receive the cash benefits after they retire. And of course, it's redistributive because it takes from the young and gives to the old. Uh, Social Security politics is oftentimes described as the third well of American politics because so many people depend on it. Uh, Social Security was one of the primary anti-poverty programs to emerge from FDR's New Deal. Uh, it was intended to provide economic support to Americans too old to work in the industrial economy, and it was later then expanded, I think in the 50s or the 60s, to also include uh, disabled persons. Uh, the idea of Social Security was quite controversial at the time because it was seen contrary to the American values of individual initiative as well as support. Uh, as late as 2015, roughly 60 million Americans received approximately $870 billion in, secured, in Social Security benefits. And the sad part is by the time I get old and by the time you all get old, you know, Social Security won't exist. It's going to end up uh, going bankrupt by the time Gen X people retire if it doesn't uh, go belly up before all of the baby boomers retire. Uh, onward. So what about Medicare? Medicare, that's the health insurance for the old. Social Security, Medicare. It's the national insurance for the elderly and for the disabled. Uh, under this program, private health care providers are reimbursed by the federal government. Uh, in the last couple of years, Medicare costs have been rising exponentially. Uh, that's a result of health care inflation, more people, like more people are getting old. Older, more people are getting old and then those old people are living for far longer than originally intended. I know that sounds so bleak, but it's like, I love my 86 year old grandmother. Anyways, and then the prescription drug benefit was then added in 2003. Uh, back in 1965, the, the federal government's social safety net expanded dramatically with Medicare. And all Medicare is is just a single payer health insurance program for the elderly and disabled provided by the government. Uh, today, more than 50 million senior citizens are covered in some way by Medicare. Uh, in recent years, this cost has been growing dramatically as a result of the rising cost of health care, threatening the fiscal solvency of the program. Ever so often, you may hear about Medicare fraud being committed. Uh, there will be like all these companies that randomly come up saying, hey, we can give you your catheters, or hey, we can give you these new diabetic treatments, or hey, we can help you get your hover round or your wheelchair or your hearing aid, even though actually hearing aids aren't covered by Medicare. They're not covered by Medicare. Uh, and there's something else that old people need that's also not covered by Medicare. But anyways, so let's see. What else about welfare? What about the public assistance? Because yeah, when you think of welfare, you're thinking about food stamps, you're thinking about TANF, you're thinking about things like that, not necessarily Social Security and Medicare. Uh, but TANF and aid, FDC, SNAP, all of those, those are means-tested public assistance policies. So by means testing, I'm just talking about there's a procedure in place that determines the eligibility for public assistance based on need and income, as well as assets below a defined level. And uh, what's it call it? Uh, TANF in particular is a non-contributory program. So in theory, the working adults do not contribute to TANF 
in hopes of when they do need it, they can, you know, get what they put back into it. Nope, it's drawn from your taxes. And so the amount of money that varies from year to year varies based on taxes as well as for the state. Uh, it also, uh, it's also varied by how much the federal government has earmarked for this program to pass out to all the 50 states. So let's see, uh, between the 30s and 90s, back when this welfare program was still known as AFDC, Aid to Families with Dependent Children, okay, yeah. Uh, it came under increasing criticism from conservatives for fostering dependence on the government for welfare support. Uh, following the 94 Republican takeover of the House of Representatives, President Clinton was persuaded to sign legislation reforming welfare by ending guaranteed cash payments in favor of temporary aid tied to a number of new requirements. And so what were these new requirements? Well, it created a five-year lifetime limit. So you could only be on TANF for five years. It doesn't matter if later down the road that something else happens, you, you, you will not qualify again. Uh, it also gave states greater flexibility. It mandated that states, uh, yeah, not, it also mandated that recipients of it had to apply for jobs. Uh, and so like they constantly have to be like showing that they're trying to become gainfully employed. Uh, what else did it have to do? It did a couple of other things too, but the uh, preamble to the uh, 1996 uh, Welfare Reform Act is called the 1996 Personal Responsibility and Workers Reconciliation Act. So P-R-O-W-A uh, was actually super racist and super misogynistic. It was like lauding upon basically poverty exists because women make bad decisions in their uh, life partners. And so as a result, that's why they are caught up in the ways that they are. And we don't want to further perpetuate the uh, cycles of poverty and toxic behavior. So this is how we're going to encourage them to pull themselves up by their bootstraps. We go in, like, yeah, I go in on social welfare, in particular the creation of TANF, in black politics, yeah. So let's see, so it's 301. Um, you're more than welcome to uh, stop here. Uh, I will probably keep going so that way I can record everything and upload it on YouTube. So that means, yeah. So you can either stay, but I'm going to keep going. It's officially 302, so cl class has ended, but I'm gonna keep going so that way this entire section will be up. So you'll see it within an hour, two hours. And so if not, we're just gonna keep riding. All right. I see more chats. I guess before we do that. Cool, that's fine. All these people, so no probs, yeah. All right, we'll just keep on going. So I can upload it, cool. All right. Oopsies. All right, so what about Medicaid, SSI, and SNAP? So Medicaid provides medical services to low-income Americans. Uh, so with this in mind, Medicaid uh, is for low-income Americans. Unlike Medicare, Medicaid is more so of a hybrid federal state program in the sense that individual states are required to contribute to the fund. Uh, one of the ways Obamacare uh, expanded access to health insurance was to expand eligibility and funding for Medicaid. And of course, as you recall, when we talked about federalism, as well as like states powers and all that stuff, the uh, Supreme Court ruled against, uh, yeah, ruled in the favor of the states saying that you cannot force states to uh, federally increase their roles, especially without fi uh, providing funding for it, funding to do so. Uh, so there's SS, yeah, so that's Medicaid, uh, SSI, it's a program related to Social Security, but it uh, stands for Supplemental Security Income. It's a means-tested program to provide income, minimum income to the elderly and disabled. So if you don't qu qualify for a Social Security disability benefit, you can apply for SSI. It's not that much money. In fact, it's a lot less than what you would, would receive, but it's better than nothing. And then finally, SNAP. 
Uh, SNAP is stands for Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. Back in the day, it used to be called Food Stamp Program. Uh, it provides food debit cards to families who pass a means test. So odds are, if you qualify for TANF, you also qualify for food stamps. However, if you qualify for food stamps, you may not necessarily qualify for TANF. Two separate things, and depending upon what state you are applying for it, the uh, threshold for food for, to qualify for SNAP may be, high, may be lower than the threshold to qualify for TANF. Varies. And so let's see, let's talk about the types of benefits that exist under uh, Medic, not Medicare, under social policies for welfare, public welfare. You can have in-kind benefits or you can have entitled benefits. In-kind benefits refer to the goods and services provided to needy families and individuals by the federal government as contrasted with cash benefits. So Medicaid and SNAP. Uh, let's see. Meanwhile, entitlement benefits uh, refers to the eligibility for said benefits by virtue of a category defined by law. Of course, these categories can change, be changed only by legislation. So, in particular, Medicare, Social Security, these are entitled entitlement benefits. Uh, the GI Bill, your uh, veteran uh, veteran survivor benefits, these are entitlement benefits. You qualify to receive those benefits by virtue of a category defined by law. So I think originally, yeah, for Social Security, it was 55 years old, even though I think now it's like 65 years old. Point being that you do not qualify for Social Security until you reach that golden age, that golden age. And then you get all of your rights and perks afforded to you as a result of qualifying. Meanwhile, for in-kind benefits, and it, it's based on the government. So it's determined by whether or not you meet this threshold. And even if you do meet said threshold, you do it's not something that's afforded to you that you are owed. Sometimes you could qualify for Medicaid and SNAP and just not get approved. It happens. Maybe there are too many people on the roll. That's happened before. Remember at one point in time, uh, my grandmother desperately needed to uh, receive SNAP and TANF to take care of my younger brother and sister. And though she qualified, she did not receive it. It was really, really difficult. But that's a sob story for another day. So what about welfare reform? So how did we get to the point where AFDC turned into TANF and that food stamps turned into SNAP? It varies. Uh, the biggest part was that ultimately welfare has never been a popular idea here in America. Uh, throughout history, political culture has valued hard work and individual initiative. Uh, individuals on public assistance, however, were seen as not pulling their weight. Their, their weight. They're lazy. They're shiftless. They're exploitative. They're manipulative. And so you don't you know, as a result, you just don't like seeing a person laying around and getting a free check because they can. That sucks. Anyways, as a result of the welfare reform during the 90s, it led to steep reductions on state welfare rolls. Uh, this was due in part to improved economic uh, conditions that, with the exception of the early minor recession of 2001 through 02, and continued into the onset of the Great Recession in 08. And then ultimately, while these changes did happen, it did not have much of an impact on reducing poverty. In fact, a lot of people have argued that as a result of restructuring uh, uh, the welfare system, so AFDC into TANF, as well as uh, food stamps into uh, SNAP, and the growing uh, costs related to housing, all of these bubble bursts, that in fact, the reform has actually increased poverty. And then there is this uh, argument talking about working poor that uh, we explore uh, briefly in black politics. But if you want to know even more about it, definitely take the uh, public policy class offered by Nestor this fall. Like she'll get into that. And so what are some of the arguments used against welfare? So why is welfare seen as bad? 
Uh, so particularly it costs too much money. It's expensive, not as expensive. I mean, like, so I guess in this case, we also have, well, well for public welfare, this is not, uh, social security. This is not Medicare. I'm talking about Medicaid. I'm talking about food stamps. I'm talking about TANF. I'm talking about those ideas. A yeah. And even a little bit of SSI. So that program costs too much money. Uh, the lack of proper incentives in healthcare causes costs to escalate. So the fact that there are individuals who can only go to the, like when they, they consider going to the emergency room, like going to see your general physician, and then they still don't have money, that causes prices to go up even more for healthcare. Uh, the welfare system is paternalistic. Uh, it encourages individuals to rely on the government for help and care and guidance. That's problematic. Uh, welfare also creates a moral hazard, incentivizing poverty. So like, why should you get up and go get a job and try and, you know, work for $8 and 50 cent an hour when you could apply for food stamps and TANF and it'll work out. And you don't have to stand on your feet flipping burgers at McDonald's. And then finally, welfare removes the burdens on employers to re, uh, to pay a living wage. Now that one, that came like that, that is to an extent true. Uh, in particular, I can't remember if this was McDonald's or Walmart, but I think it was McDonald's. This came out, I want to say within the last four or five years, uh, right around the push for minimum wage to be increased to $15 an hour. I can't remember what state it was in that this major uh, company, we're gonna say for the time being, I believe it was McDonald's, uh, came out with this guide that stated how can a person uh, making, you know, making their standard wage at McDonald's, how can they live, go from month to month? And one of the first things that's listed on the itemized budget was receiving welfare. In particular, they were receiving food stamps and TANF and they had a second job. So yeah, it had to be McDonald's in California that showed how they how their employees could survive on their wage. And so they had a second job, they received TANF, and they received food stamps. That's outrageous. And I remember there was like a whole bunch of hoopla, because I think even I retweeted a couple of things that were essentially saying, McDonald's knows what they're doing is janky. Like if you know that, you know, you're not paying your people enough and you know that your employees have to then rely on public assistance to make it from month to month, then maybe you should increase your, you know, increase your wage just a wee bit, just a wee bit. Uh, so what about why we do need the welfare system? Uh, let's see, the welfare system stabilizes the economy. It provides a safety net for the weakest of us, for the least of us. Uh, paternalism is not a bad thing if it promotes savings such as Social Security does. Uh, let's see. Welfare is the savior of capitalism. It corrects for its imperfections. Uh, the, problem of, the problem is not necessarily the receipts in the program, it's the system. Not the people who are poor. It's not that welfare creates lazy, trifling people. It's the fact that uh, cap the capitalist society makes it so that there is always going to be a proportion of society that is going to be disadvantaged and marginalized. And so we should be looking at the system that creates this cycle as well as this pool of disadvantage and marginalization. Uh, and then finally, welfare is politically essential. You don't want to end up having a, prop, a proportion of your public that is marginalized, that are disadvantaged, that are economically oppressed, and you're not trying to provide any type of support or guidance for them because those will be the individuals that will see to you not winning re-election if they don't like cause a coup or a revolution beforehand. So that's the end of social policy. What about foreign policy? So foreign policy refers to programs and policies that determines America's relations with other nations as well as with other foreign entities. 
uh, the nation's chief foreign policy people are the president, Congress, and the bureaucracy. So you see two of those three are uh, relegated to the executive branch while the remaining one is the legislative branch. Uh, let's see. In general, foreign policy is not thought of as a, you know, as a Republican thing or a Democratic thing. It's oftentimes thought of as a nonpartisan issue. Uh, let's see. Foreign policy includes diplomacy, military and security policy, international human rights policies, and various forms of economic policy, such as trade policy and international energy policy. And so in this sense, foreign policy is very much intertwined with both economic policy and social policy. And so one of the uh, goals of social policy, not social, foreign policy is security. And so by that, we're talking about promoting security and that, and so in doing so, we're talking about the fact that uh, food supplies, infrastructure, energy supplies, and the physical security of the population are protected from foreign threats. And then more recently, in uh, light of the controversy surrounding uh, Russian government efforts to influence the American political uh, presidential election, we could also add protecting American political institutions to the list of security concerns. So what about NGOs? Not, or in particular, NSAs, non-state actors. All non-state actors are or just groups other than the nation state that attempt to play a role in the international system. One of the biggest NSAs are terrorist groups. Uh, we also have charity organizations. Uh, let's see, I think the WHO is a, also a non-state actor. But generally when we're talking about non-state actors, we're primarily talking about those that are looked at in a bad life trying to negatively impact the state in question, the nation state in question. So what is isolationism? All isolationism is we mind our own business. That's all it is, mind your own business. I mind my own business, you mind yours. It's just the desire to avoid involvement in the affairs of others. The Monroe Doctrine of 1823 established the Western Hemisphere as a region, not a region, as a region under the sphere of influence of the United States. And so it's quite possible to consider the Monroe Doctrine as a early departure away from isolationism. Uh, so combined with notions of manifest destiny, one could argue that American claims over the Western Hemisphere suggest not isolation, but rather a strong willingness to engage in international affairs. Uh, later in that same century, 19th century, America was involved in the Mexican-American uh, Mexican War, uh, acquired Alaska and Hawaii, uh, there was also the Spanish-American War, and all of these things illustrates Americans' willingness to engage in international affairs purportedly during the isolationist 19th century. And then also have to remember immediately after World War I, Woodrow Wilson was like, we gonna mind our own business. We, we gonna once again engage in isolation politics. Like that's the first time I learned about isolation politics, learning about it uh, in AP US history talking about Woodrow Wilson post World War One. It's like mind our own business. This international affairs stuff is for the birds. But of course we've known, especially like in the last 100 years, that has not been the case. Never mind our own business. And so since isolationism is not a thing, there are other aspects, other practices that go on also in foreign policy. Uh, we could talk about containment, deterrence, as well as appeasement. Containment refers to policies designed to curtail the political and military expansion of a hostile power. So you place them in the boundary, you place them within a certain parameter, and that way that's where they stay. Deterrence, on the other hand, that is development and maintenance of military strength as a means of discouraging attack. So it's like, yeah, I see you building up your little stick army, but over here, we got guns. So you see us building all of these guns or you see us building all of these nuclear bombs? That means you need to go take your sticks and go sit down somewhere. 
that's deterrence. And then finally, appeasement. Appeasement just refers to efforts to forestall, to uh, prevent a war or forestall a war by giving in to the demands of the hostile power. All right, stick building people. You said you will stop building up your stick army if we give you ice cream. I don't want to give you some of my Jenny's ice cream, but I also don't want to use all these nuclear bombs. So I'm going to give you some of my Jenny's ice cream. So that way we don't have to, we don't, none of this has to blow up. You don't have to use your stick army. I don't have to use my nuclear bombs. I think I can afford living with less Jenny's ice cream and everything works out. So I appeased the hostile power. So preemption, what is preemption? So all preemption is, is just foreign policy principles that permit a first strike in order to prevent an enemy attack. The idea is similar to a preventive war. So an exa I'm like, uh, example of this, for those of you that play RPGs, or for those of you that do uh, first person shooters, and they ask you like to sneak up on a enemy. And you know, you're supposed to sneak up behind them so that way they don't know what's going on and you take them out. Uh, in role playing games, how you sneak up on an enemy and you make the first strike. That's preemption. I am going to get you before you get me. That's all that is. And so the uh, Bush Doctrine formulated immediately after 9-11 argued that ultimately America should take preemptive action against threats to its national security. So I'm gonna get you out before you get me out because I already heard through my security people, through my spies, that you plotting something. So I'm not gonna let you, you know, I'm not gonna let you pop off. Nope, I'm gonna take you out before you have a chance to hit me. I'm hip to the game. And so ultimately the idea of preemption is similar to the idea of preventive war. Uh, back during the Obama administration, uh, he demonstrated an effort to engage with our adversaries. Uh, Iran, for instance. However, Bush, not Bush, Obama did not renounce the Bush doctrine for those states that declined to become constructively engaged. So it's like for those who are willing to talk, we can talk, but for those other ones, <laughs> If you don't want to talk, I will continue to promote the Bush Doctrine. So I will take you out if you're not willing to uh, come to the table and negotiate. If we're not going to, you know, have this idea or exercise of appeasement, then I will, you know, we will pop off. Hence all of those drone attacks. And so what about the Cold War? What was this? Oh man. So. AP US history people, this Cold War and as well as IB 20th century topics, history, 20th, 20th century world history. Cold War, the period of struggle between America and the USSR between the late 40s and the early 90s. The reason why it's a cold, called a Cold War, not a hot war, it's because America and the Soviet Union never directly fought each other. Instead, they fought in a lot of proxy wars, in proxy hotspots, such as Berlin, the Cuban Missile Crisis, Vietnam, Latin America, maybe a little bit in, in the Korean War. So like Russia, yeah, so the USSR and America never really came to official blows. Instead, they sent representatives Russia sent representatives and they fought each other, the, the representatives fought with each other in proxy spots. So it would be like if I was, you know, if I was beefing and another person was beefing, we're not going to go out and square up. No, no. I am going to send my home girl, my enemy is going to send their home girl, and they are going to allegedly duke it out somewhere else. And then we'll keep doing that over and over and over again until finally myself and my enemy are like, look, this is for the birds. But yeah, that's a cold war. And so ultimately, while cold, you know, this, this is what we call the cold war, very few parts of the world were untouched by this ideological battle between capitalism and communism. Uh, in particular, the Korean War, the Vietnam War, and several civil wars in Latin America and Africa were in part conflicts fought over these ideologies. Uh, the closest America and the USSR ever came to direct conflict was probably back in 1962 during the Cuban Missile Crisis. 
Uh, during that situation, America learned that the Soviet missiles were directed at the U.S. from the communist island of Cuba, which of course is 90 miles away from Florida. Uh, the JFK administration instituted a naval blockade of Cuba. Uh, a more serious crisis was averted when the Soviet Union agreed to remove the missiles in exchange for an American assurance not to invade Cuba. So yeah, that was the closest we ever came to blows, but that was also the closest we ever came to not being born, none of us existing. The globe would have been destroyed as a result of nuclear bombs. Stressful stuff, y'all. Stressful stuff. And so how did all this end? Well, the Truman, Do uh, the Truman Doctrine ultimately announced that the major goal of foreign policy would be to contain the spread of communism. Uh, when the Soviet Union finally fell in 1991, it, con uh, it marked a success, a victory for the Truman Doctrine, as well as a victory for the policy of containment. So keeping the USSR, particularly within those bounds as defined or identified by the US, and just waited it out and to see what happens in 1991, it worked out. It's like, hooray, they fell, we won, hooray. So what about economic prosperity? That's like the second uh, foreign policy goal. So what we're talking about, two things here. There's the most favored nation status. That is just an agreement to offer a trading partner the lowest tariff offered to another trading partner. So it's like, I like you, Mexico. And so because I like you, Mexico, I'm going to provide you this tariff rate. It's because we're special, okay? You're special to me. You're one of my favorite countries. And so the way that this is actually extended in, in idea, we have NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement. And that was just a, an agreement between us, Mexico and Canada to lower and eliminate tariffs. So both Canada and Mexico, they are more favored nations. Cause you know, that's the uh, top half of the, uh, what is that? The Northern Hemisphere? Yep, cause South America is the Southern Hemisphere. Yep. Uh, in particular, so how did, uh, since then, uh, NAFTA has been in the news. Uh, that as well as the Trans-Pacific Partnership, these became discussion points during the 2016 presidential campaigns as Trump uh, made opposition, said, uh, uh, expressed opposition to both of these practices because they were bad trade agreements. And so what about these humanitarian goals? So this is the third aspect of economic policy. Uh, we're talking about environmental protection, human rights, and peacekeeping efforts aimed at improving the lives of individuals in other nations. Uh, humanitarian concerns frequently take a backseat to American security and economic concerns. So who makes American foreign policy? First one, the president. Uh, the president of the U.S. is the head of the state and commander-in-chief. Uh, as a result of being head of state and commander-in-chief, it allows him or her to exercise substantial control over American diplomatic and military institutions. Uh, as a result, presidential authority over foreign policy has grown substantially since World War II. Uh, during this time, since World War II, presidents have asserted greater and more authority over the commitment of American military, even in the absence of an explicit congressional authorization. So remember, there's only been, America has only been in five official wars because Congress has the power to declare war. And the last war we have been in was World War II. So every quote unquote war since World War II were not are not real wars because Congress did not declare war. Anyways, uh, this ultimately this expansion of presidential military powers have come about despite the fact that the Constitution explicitly gives Congress the power to declare war and limits the president to the po position of commander in chief during wartime. Uh, after the attacks of 9-11, uh, President Bush explicitly stated that he did not need congressional authorization to use force in Afghanistan, although he did ultimately seek and did get authorization. 
uh, back when President Obama ordered American warplanes into uh, Libya, he di also did so without consulting Congress. And so what about the bureaucracy? How do they make foreign policy? So there are multiple agencies that exist to implement American foreign policy. These include the State Department, the DOD, as well as the CIA. Uh, however, all three of these agencies may not always see eye to eye or have the same interests. Uh, more recently, we have the Department of Homeland Security as well as the Director of National Intelligence that are now also involved in the mix. And so ultimately, while all these bureaucracies retain a significant amount of political independence and policy discretion, uh, American presidents exert significant authority and direction over the bureaucratic agencies simply by virtue of appointing the agency staff. And so what does Congress do? How does Congress make American foreign policy? Well, as you all remember, they have the constitutional power to declare a war. Uh, as likewise, the Senate in particular ratifies treaties as well as confirmed presidential appointments. Recall, Congress has the power of the purse, money, 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 uh, as well as the power to regulate commerce with foreign nations. Uh, Congress also has the power of investigation and oversight. And so, as I stated before, this will be an extra credit question on the final exam, I believe. There are, not there are, Congress has declared war just five times. And these times are the War of 1812, the Mexican War, the Spanish-American War, World War I, and World War II. So once again, the War of 1812, the Mexican War, the Spanish-American War, World War One and World War Two, uh, and so since these five times, uh, the highlights is that uh, so the fact that Congress has only declared war officially five times demonstrates the smaller role Congress has played, uh, perhaps since the con since the Constitution was uh, ratified. Clearly, I mean, one would argue that the framers of the Constitution did not could not see that Congress would ultimately have a decreased role in international affairs, especially as it relates to military occupations and operations. Uh, the Senate in particular is important for the conduct of foreign policy as they have, uh, as they're responsible for the uh, confirmation of presidential appointments as well as the ratifications of treaties. Uh, but even here, uh, via the increased use of executive agreements, and, and in this case being the agreements between the president and the leader of another country has the force of a treaty. So even in that way, the Senate does not have as much power either because the president could just bypass the whole treaty ratification process and just write up an executive order that would have the same staying power. And so what about interest groups? How do they make American foreign policy? Well, it varies. So in particular, economic interest groups, single interest groups like the tobacco industry are the most effective. Uh, they can do so just by making sure that their interests in these foreign countries come about successfully. Uh, ethnic lobbying in particular is also examples. Uh, the Israel lobby as well as the Irish lobby, in particular the pro-Israel PACs, they do not play. Um, let's see, for the brief amount of time, I want to say last spring that Ilan Omar was in the uh, news and was getting drugged for filth. It was because she stated something. She didn't say the pro-Israel super PAC was bad. She just said something along the lines of, it wasn't like they're like, yeah, they're money hungry, they're awful. They just said, yeah, they care about money. And it was automatically seen as anti-Semitic. They would drug her through the mud. Nancy Pelosi had to censor her. Yeah, the, uh, the pro-Israel lobbyists, the pro-Israel uh, super PACs and interest groups, they do not play. They, 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 they are strong and extremely influential. It can be also kind of semi-problematic, but they don't play. They, they are really influential in DC politics. And then there are also human rights organizations, Amnesty International, as well as the Christian Coalition. They can also help make foreign policy. 
And so putting it all together, what happens when there's a crisis? Uh, in times of crisis, it tends to concentrate forward policy power really into the hands of the president. Uh, in general, presidents will far more power over foreign policy than they do over domestic policy. Um, as a single individual charged with commanding American military forces, the commanding, uh, yeah, the president is in a unique position to respond to foreign policy issues. Uh, with control over the foreign policy bureaucracy, presidents, presidents wield far greater power in the arena of foreign policy than in domestic policy, where there's a whole bunch of other political forces there to serve as checks and balances. And so, what are some of the instruments of, Amer of modern foreign policy? Biggest ones being the State Department as well as, yeah, and really just the power of diplomacy. Uh, of course, diplomacy is the representation of the, a government to other governments. Uh, the Department of State is the national government's chief diplomatic arm. So while the president is the number one diplomat, the second diplomat comes from the Department of the State. So, as well as, you know, the Secretary of the State would be the number two diplomat, and then all of the other people within the State Department. That's like three, four, five, six, seven, eight, all the way through number 1,000. And so, thanks to the 1946 Foreign Service Act, it created a whole core of professional diplomats. I remember at one point in time, I had thought about a study of... Uh, really more so focusing on international relations. There was a point in time I thought I wanted to be a diplomat or work for some diplomatic branch. Like, I, that's what I thought. But then I discovered uh, black politics and race and ethnicity and political behavior and then decided to become a professor. It's still a cool gig, though. So what about military force? Uh, military force is super expensive. And so... As a result, you know, it costs a lot of money, people can die, it's just, it causes death and devastation, sadness, all that stuff. As a result, military force is a tool of last resort. If all else fails, then we pop off. Military action is inherently risky and it can bring with it casualties, loss of life, loss of land, you could lose, they could win. It's a, it's a huge gamble. And, at, and as such, it's super risky as because outcomes are usually uncertain. So, yeah. Last slide for this section and for the semester, whoop de whoop arbitration. Uh, an intern uh, uh, arbitration refers to the alternative form of dispute resolution. Uh, it involves referring an international agreement, inter an international disagreement to a neutral third party. Uh, arbitration is considered a form of soft power. And so an example of, of an arbitrary space for international conflicts, that's the International Court of Justice. That's the UN's chief judicial agency. It settles disputes submitted by UN member states. Uh, the World Trade Organization is also another example. Uh, they provide they provided arbitration uh, within trade disputes between nations. Uh, and so this body ultimately examined and adjudicated claims under unfair trade practices between two nations. And so with all of that, we finished talking about economic policy, social policy, and foreign policy. So that three all together, that is the American public policy section. On Monday, we will review for the midterm. Uh, Ellie and Elizabeth will get do their presentations. And that is that. That's the end of the semester. So enjoy the weekend. Yeah.